All right, so this is week three of hickories. I think we'll maybe take a break for a little bit and then we'll wrap up the last two uh, after maybe covering some other things so we don't get too burned out on hickories. Uh, did anyone, was anyone able to identify a pig nut hickory last week? Nice, right on. Um, so <clears throat> those, so we've covered the two most common ones that you're gonna encounter, but um, I, see, I see a few of the others often enough. I think they're worth mentioning. And it's just good to be aware uh, that they're around. And so today we're covering Caria cordiformis, which is also known as bitter nut hickory. And uh, we'll cover identifying features first. So of all of the hickories, this one is going to, well, minus pecan, but uh, this one will have the most amount of leaflets. It's seven to 11, but mostly nine. And so right away, if you're like looking up into the canopy, and uh, you're seeing nine leaflets, you can be pretty certain that that's going to be uh, um, bitter nut hickory as long as you can rule out pecan. <clears throat> All right, and so the, the bark can be an identifying feature. Uh, it does have that XY braided pattern, but it tends to be more uh, oppressed against the trunk, meaning it, it doesn't form the ridges as deeply. That's a pretty soft characteristic. I've pretty confidently identified a number where it wasn't like obvious that the, the bark was like flatter. Like one of the NC State professors in a YouTube video talks about it almost having like an ironed appearance. Um, and on this tree it does. This is actually one of the biggest ones I've seen and that is at um, Mason Preserve Biological Farm. I think if you've all been on that trail. Um, <clears throat> And the nuts are also different than the other hickories we've discussed that it lacks like the snout of the pig nut. It's a thin shell. And then as the name suggests, they're quite bitter. Even for wildlife, it doesn't tend to be like as valued of a nut um, as some of the other hickories. And then one of the other interesting features of the nut is that the sutures only run about halfway up the, the husk. <clears throat> so it won't completely open. All right, the really distinguishing feature though on this hickory is going to be the bud. It's a valvate bud as opposed to the imbricate large buds of, um, of mocker nut. Uh, imbricate meaning kind of like overlapping scales, think of like a snake skin. Uh, valvate meaning the two bud scales sort of come together without overlapping. But the really distinguishing feature is the kind of sulfur yellow color of that bud. And there is not another uh, hickory bud that looks like it. That is my main identifying uh, feature that I look for. Um, if they're not in uh, within grabbing distance, you know, counting the leaflets is, a, is another great way. But one of, one of the general things I hope you're picking up on are all of the different features that you can use to get a tree to, to species. And then once you're able to start, you know, you learn to look at the bud on one tree, but then that sort of opens your eyes a little bit to noticing some of those features on other trees. So I, I hope you're picking up on that, that these are, this is like a general methodology about how to approach trees. We're looking at the bark, we're, getting, we're looking at the leaves, and then especially in winter, looking at those buds becomes uh, really significant. <clears throat> All right, so in terms of its range, really commonly distributed, it's avoided Florida probably for their politics. Um, across the East Coast, yeah, really heavily present in all geographic regions of North Carolina, coastal, Piedmont, uh, the mountains. It's pretty adaptable to a wide array of soil types. Like pignut, it's got a deep tap root, which means that it is difficult to transplant. Um, <clears throat> All right, so some of the interesting characteristics, uh, this, I, I kind of like this quote, is from NC State's page, somewhat inferior to the other hickories, but used for the same purposes. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I, I believe what they were saying, so it's one of the shorter lived hickories, it lives about 200 years. So, you know, put that short lived into perspective. Um, where the other hickories, I think you can see, live three to 400 years. Um, so it is similar to the other hickories, a larval host for butterflies and moths. And I had read about the horned devil caterpillar, but I hadn't actually like looked it up until I did this slide preparation. It's pretty impressive. They're supposed to be pretty rare to find. Um, you can see quite large, really dramatic. Uh, so if you find one, let me know. And then that's the moth form down low, the regal butterfly, or no, regal moth, sorry. Um, but they are, they are a host for these, meaning they're also supporting, by virtue of being hosts for these uh, moths and caterpillars, they're supporting bird populations. Um, so they are shade intolerant, which 
is interesting because pigment actually does quite well in the shade, similar to beech. It's gonna be really, really slow, slow growth until it's released or there's a, a, a spot in the canopy that opens up and then growth will accelerate. You are not going to find um, uh, bitternut hickory doing well in the shade similarly. So probably more of a tree that you're gonna see out in the open or along the edges of, uh, edges of things. But other hickories do okay? The, the pig nut does. I don't remember looking up that information from Ocker Nut, but pig nut specifically, they talked about how well it does in the shade until it's, until it's released. Um, and in general, climax species, this is something that we've covered a little bit. Um, do you all remember kind of like what that term means, climax species? Does anyone want to like summarize? So it has to do with forest succession and the way landscapes change over hundreds, if not thousands of years, like the types of plant communities you find with them. They tend to go through periods of upheaval where you find like a lot of pioneer species, things that are kind of like preparing the soil. And then over time you get into a more stable ecosystem and you end up with a composition of trees and plants that may remain in that composition for hundreds and hundreds of years. And at that point, we'd be looking at our climax species. They tend to be long lived. They tend to be shade tolerant like American beech because they have to be because the, the larger trees, you know, live for a long period of time. And in order to replace, in order to um, kind of put out the next generation, they have to be able to persist in that shade waiting for their moment to come. Not, not super important for us as arborists to know about it, but it is an interesting um, feature of these trees to note about our local silva. Uh, and then another interesting characteristic about hickories in general that I hadn't brought up that is relevant to homeowners and relevant to the type of um, services or discounts that we might offer a client is that hickory makes really fantastic firewood, burns really hot. Um, whenever you see like hickory smoked bacon, like they are referring to caria, um, true hickory. So that is a good tree. Uh, clients will ask me sometimes, you know, is this a good tree for firewood? And that's not something I'm like natively super interested in. And so I usually have to look it up, but I'm trying to be better about that because it does come up a little bit more. Hickories are a good one to leave for firewood. So on that, it's yeah. very difficult to split, however, the hickories. So yeah. Large diameter hickory wood, very and then also it will rot very quickly if you leave it uncovered. So it becomes worthless. Um, yeah, but other than that, the, the main virtue of the fire is that it keeps its coals overnight. Um, so if you're smoking or something like that or want a long burn. All right, yeah, so to kind of summarize, burns well, but really tough wood, so it might be hard to split. That's right. Coals overnight, it's not going to, you're not going to be able to let it sit for like years on end and in your most yard. homeowners are just yeah. going to, you're going to leave it for firewood and it's going to be rotted next time you come back there. Right. Um, two years later. And then I really, I really don't like placing trees in like pantheons of value, but um, as the name implies, the nuts are bitter and they are actually less preferred by wildlife um, <clears throat> than the nuts of some of the other hickories. And then just some interesting social history. Um, hickories, because of that, that durable and the really hard quality of the wood that Craig mentioned, if you've heard the phrase tough as nails, like back in the day, they used the phrase tough as hickory. In fact, Andrew Jackson, who is the uh, seventh president of the US, he was kind of known for his grit, in, especially in combat. And he earned the name Old Hickory because of that grit. Um, and I just thought that was an interesting way in which, you know, there was a sort of familiarity with these trees that we don't lack as much any, or that we lack now, uh, because we're not working with the natural landscape in the same way. So interesting to know, Andrew Jackson, tough as hickory. And then one thing I also wanted to, to touch on lightly is that within these um, presentations where we're kind of going over specific information, um, we're covering a lot of the material directly or indirectly that you're going to find on the ISA certified arborist tests. Um, and I wanted to point out some of that information that we've been covering um, <clears throat> really quickly. So one, we've been focusing on scientific names. Does anyone remember, by the way, what some of the um, Latin was for like mockernut or pignut and why that might be interesting to know? Yeah, and which, so Caria glabra, and that referred to pignut, I heard it. And, and what does glabrous mean? Smooth, smooth. smooth, yeah, nice. And then what is, what is the identifying feature that is smooth on a pignut? The rachis. The rachis, yeah, specifically the petiole. I think sometimes there's some pubescence, but on the, the rachis. Um, <clears throat> all right, so within, and that, that 
construction, Caria glabra, that is a binomial. Bi means two, nomial kind of like two names. So Caria is the first part, glabra is the second part. Does anyone know what Caria refers to? Genus. Yeah, so Caria refers to the genus. <laughs> and then, uh, and then so glabra, this is a bit of a trick question, but what does glabra refer to? Nice, you got it. Yeah, so it's not the species. And this, this is a question that was on both my climber certification test as well as my ISA test. Caria is the genus. Glabra is the specific epithet because just the word glabra doesn't tell you what genus the tree is from. So there's not enough information to be like, oh, this is a species. So the species then is the genus with the specific epithet. It's Caria glabra. <clears throat> and there, are, there will be questions. And then it's always italicized. Or if you're on Instagram obsessively posting about plants, you put it in quotes. Um, and only the, only the genus gets, or yeah, only the genus gets capitalized. Uh, and that, that is a, a test question that I came across. Um, really quickly, the terms monoecious and dioecious. It's, I don't think it's, you necessarily need to memorize these, but it's, it's good to remember. Um, so for, within, with hickories, <clears throat> are there male and female hickories? Anyone have a, have a thought? Yes. yes. Why, why do you say yes? I'm just guessing. You're just guessing, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Johnson, Johnson. No. No, all right, so no. what would be, but they have male and female parts, right? Yeah. So then how do, how do hickories, kind of get it going. What is their anatomical construction? So they flower once. They yeah. flower and they release the pollen. And then their, their part, the receptacles that receive the pollen open up slightly later. So yeah, so there are male and female parts on the hickory. Some trees, they divide it out. And then some trees can actually, like in the case of ginkgo, if there are no females around, one branch might just decide to go to go female. Gender gets really wild in the plant kingdom. Life finds a way. <laughs> yeah, life finds a way. So the, the term then is monoecious. Mono means one. And you think about in one house, there is a male and a female living there, as opposed to like the I Love Lucy, where you've got the male and the female in two separate beds. Dioecious. So it's a little confusing. I, I kept thinking monoecious meant like one gender per tree, but it means... The Greek, I believe it's Greek, refers to one house. So monoecious, both genders on one plant. Dioecious, you're gonna find those characteristics separated onto separate plants. And this actually has created in the urban forest some interesting issues where people have preferentially planted male plants a lot of the time to avoid messy fruits, which are associated with the female parts. Um, but what happens is you dramatically increase like the pollen load if you're only planting male species. And so uh, that, that can become an issue. And, and specifically with the case of ginkgo, like it's almost always male plants that you're finding at nurseries because the female like fruit is like wildly uh, malodorous, supposedly. It smells like dog vomit. <clears throat> um, and then the last question, we've been talking a lot about buds, so we'll just review a quick bit of information on that. What, what is in a bud? Like what, what happens with a bud going from winter to like a growing season? What, it, what does it do? So I gather nutrients preparing to put out leaves and twigs. Okay, so it produces, yeah, you just, you just nail leaves, twigs, and flowers. So essentially like all parts of a tree are developing within that tissue. And so the type of tissue actually has, um, has a name and it's important to know for the, the ISA test. So this is a good, a good spot of review. Anyone have an idea of what that tissue might be called? It's, there are a couple places where this type of tissue occurs. And uh, in this case, it's called the apical because it's happening at the apex, the end of the twig or the top of the tree. Somebody, somebody said it's the maristem. Yeah. So meristem, <clears throat> which always makes me think of maritime, but meristem, apical meristem, and the, the meristem is essentially just undifferentiated tissue, meaning it has the capacity to produce the various organs of a plant or the, you know, flowers, twigs, leaves. So shoot elongation, that's happening from the bud. Flower happening from the bud. In some trees, it's really obvious, like on a dogwood, the, the flower buds almost look like little UFOs. They're, they're sort of 
like oblong, whereas the uh, the leaf and shoot buds are are a lot more kind of like traditional. So some trees, it's easy to, to tell the difference. But anyways, any questions on bitternut hickory? Look at the bud. That is the easiest way to tell the difference. It doesn't have shaggy bark. It's got a yellow bud and a hell of a lot of leaflets. And that is bitternut hickory.